podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Chat with Green Aggies. My name is Erfan Vafai, and we have the uh, rest of our usual panelists that are in here today. And we're going to be focusing in uh, a little bit today. I'm going to be talking about white flies. Um, sorry, my video is not showing for those of you who are, are live. Um, having some some trouble on my mac with uh video um it's not letting me show it but anyway so when we're talking white flies i think um you know the reason why i want to talk about this one in particular was we're starting to see some white fly populations build up and poinsettia season is like right around the corner um and you know they usually get quite a bit of white flies and whatever plants you have now that are you're going to hold over are going to be Oh, you're, you're helping essentially inoculate your poinsettias, right? You're helping kind of build those populations. So I think it was worthy to learn a little bit about white flies, um, you know, the species that are out there, uh, and then basically how to manage them. Now, there's over 1,300 white fly species described, but really there's only a few that are kind of relevant to the green industry. Two of which are the greenhouse white fly, Trilaroides vaporiorium, and the sweet potato slash silver leaf white fly and or Bemisia species complex. So it's Bemisia tabassi slash species complex. I'm gonna be talking about why it's considered a species complex uh, instead of just one individual species here. We're talking about identification. Another one you might see quite a bit, oh, sorry. Another one you might see quite a bit is the banded wing white fly, which is very aptly named because the wings are the banded, as you can see right here. Um, we have the greenhouse white fly and the sweet potato, or again, sometimes referred to as a silver leaf white fly. And these are, you know, the two main ones that you might see in Texas. Most of what I have seen is this sweet potato white fly. I do sometimes see the banded wing white fly, which is not considered a major pest in ornamental. So they can establish, they can breed, but usually not to the same types of populations we'll see of the sweet potato white fly. Sometimes we can have a mix, so sometimes we can have greenhouse white fly in there as well, but again, most of what we've seen uh, in Texas is the sweet potato white fly. There are some slight differences in how they look. So banded wing is very simple because of those bands, but when we're talking between greenhouse and sweet potato, let will say the way that the wings are held are a little bit different, so the wings are held quite a bit more flat in the greenhouse white fly, and there's differences in the exuvia. So after they you know, pupate, they come out as adults, so we'll see the immatures here shortly and what they look like. But after they come out of the pupa, uh, the greenhouse uh, white fly exuvias typically has quite longer hairs than, say, the Bimesia um, species do. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, so this is, is quite complicated uh, when we're talking sweet potato white flies as an individual species because it's actually a, a mix of species. Um, here we go. So, so within Bemisia tabassi, we have a few different what we refer to as biotypes. All right, we had this A biotype, which uh, started to become kind of problematic. This is kind of when white flies first started to become problematic, you know, several decades ago, uh, was kind of this one group that um, was, was relatively prolific. Then we had uh, the B biotype, AKA, also now known as meme one. Uh, and you'll see it actually is uh, looks very similar. It's actually identical. I've just flipped it upside down. So morphologically speaking, they are indistinguishable. So you can't tell them uh, any difference between the two. And then we have the Q biotype, which you can see here is also rather identical, but in this case is wearing glasses and a mustache. So it's trying to disguise itself. But this is the Q biotype is also known as uh, MED or M-E-D. And these are technically different species. They were originally referred to as biotypes because they, they noticed they had some uh, pretty unique characteristics in terms of the types of uh, plants that they preferred, uh, their reproductive rate, and uh, resistance to insecticides. So one of the reasons why it's so important, and we'll see here in a moment, to know or at least be familiar with the idea that there are different ones uh, is, is, is in, related to what will actually work to manage them. And you know, I'd said like that this Bemisia complex is kind of complicated um, because just in, you know, 2012, they found that this Bemisia tabassa, so sweet potato white fly, is actually considered a complex composed of 28 morphologically indistinguishable species. So actually using DNA molecular tools and then followed up by behavioral assays uh, to see if they can actually reproduce, 
they found that Bimesia tabassa, and that's why they already have two different common names, silver leaf whitefly and sweet potato whitefly, is actually more than 28 uh, identically looking but different species. Uh, and so that kind of helps complicate things a little bit. But again, just important to be aware of it. And this is why this is important. So as an example, if we look at, so this is New World or the A biotype, this is meme one or the B biotype, and this is med or the Q biotype. If we look at some of their characteristics, right, this New World one had a very narrow uh, host plant range, whereas both the meme one and med, right, this is like when we started getting these ones, they were very problematic because they, they can feed on a lot of different plants. In terms of biotic potential, that's the reproductive rate. So again, that new world was relatively slow to reproduce, whereas when we got this B biotype or meme one, they have very high reproductive capacity, so they become problematic very quick. Something important to note here is that the Q biotype has a low reproductive capacity compared to the meme one, and that's gonna be very relevant uh, a little bit later when we're talking about management. In terms of virus transmission, right, they can also be quite a bit different. So we have the B biotype can be a lot better at transmitting viruses, say, than the Q biotype. And the Q biotype, on the other hand, or again, MED, has much higher insecticide resistance than those other ones. So it can be a lot harder to control. So as an example, this is an excellent publication from University of Florida, uh, their extension service. Uh, I do recommend checking out if you're looking for a full management guide. But you can see here, they kind of break down the different suggested products. Um, and then whether it's, it'll control meme one or the med biotype. So you'll see there's some insecticides that'll work um, against both. And then there's others that work against one and not the other. So pyroproxifen is actually what uh, some of the labs use to maintain the B biotype. So they'll keep spraying pyroproxifen because it's really hard to distinguish them physically. But if you keep spraying pyroproxifen, you know your population is going to be this Q biotype because you've killed, this, this meme one is susceptible and you've killed them all, uh, but your Q biotype remains. So uh, that's basically what you're gonna happen on your operation, right? If you have Q biotype or if you keep spraying pyroproxifen, you're gonna be selecting very quickly for this Q biotype or GAN med. Uh, other insecticides like Endeavor, uh, NSTAR, Talus, all of these work against the one about type, but not the other. So it, it can be helpful or important to try and look for things that will uh, work for both biotypes if you're not sure, sure uh, if it works or not, uh, sorry, if you're not sure which biotype you have, or at least rotate uh, in some of these that work against both biotypes. <clears throat> now, in terms of the general life cycle, right? So we've all seen the adults, uh, they can fly around and, and disperse that way. Each female can lay between 70 to 80 eggs. And uh, those eggs take about five to 22 days to come out as instars. So here it is, then it goes through first instar, second instar, third instar, and then this pupil-like stage where it metamorphoses into a new adult. So you'll see these, nymph these nymphal stages, obviously they can't fly. Um, they have very limited mobility and they're quite flat and small in the leaf, so very hard to see with the naked eye. So we'll see a bit later some monitoring tools, including a head lens, to be able to see these on the undersides of the leaves. From egg to adult can vary greatly from basically two weeks to two months. So if it's in, during the warmer or hotter season, you're gonna see that generation time be a lot shorter, so the population is gonna build up much quicker. Now, it's very important when we're talking uh, insecticidal management, as we'll see here a bit later, um, to break the life cycle, right? So if you're spraying something that requires contact on the immatures or uh, is like an insect growth regulator, that's, again, maybe going to impact the immatures more uh, than, say, either adult or egg stage, you want to make sure to spray again in 7 or 14 days to make sure that you get anything new that has emerged. Now, in terms of damage, we're all probably very familiar. You know, white flies produce honeydew, and uh, when you get copious amounts of honeydew, that sooty mold can start to grow on it. And if we're talking ornamental production, that is considered uh, at this point unacceptable. Right? I mean, you can't you can't sell that, and you need to get rid of that. There are some viruses that are also transmitted by white flies, so that's something to uh, be aware of. There's 114 virus species that are transmitted by white flies. 111 of them that have been described 
are transmitted by the sweet potato whitefly. So like the vast majority of these viruses come from this Bimesian. That's why it's kind of important uh, when it comes to management of this particular whitefly. And there are some that are considered persistent versus semi-persistent. So that basically means that there are some viruses that uh, say the whitefly feeds on and it goes into say their blood basically makes its way back into salivary or grant gland it can build up that way and go back to the plant so they can there's usually a bit of an incubation period right so they feed on a, an infected plant it might take a little while before they can transmit it but when they can they can transmit it for a relatively prolonged period of time whereas semi-persistent essentially is almost like a mechanical uh, transmission. So they feed on an infected plant, they can almost immediately infect a, a non-infected plant. Um, but you know, if they feed on a non-infected plant for a little while, they, they won't have that virus in them anymore. That's important to consider if, if you suspect you have a virus of white flies, first thing, you know, send, send some sample material to the plant diagnostic clinic, and then be very careful if you're spraying insecticides you may be disturbing those white flies, they will be moving around and thus uh, maybe helping the spread of the virus. So you, you wanna use something that would uh, be an anti-feedant or, or a very quick kill um, in order to reduce the, the movement of that virus. Uh, in terms of monitoring, yellow sticky cards can work quite well. And you can see these are all fungus gnats practically on here, right? So you gotta kind of sift through and look for those white flies. We've also spoken in the past about yellow sticky tape. So that can also help suppress, you can see here, a whole lot of fungus gnats. We've talked about how that can help suppress uh, thrips populations and uh, also suppress some white fly populations as well. But here's an example of what those white flies can look like on the yellow sticky card, right? Because off of it, I mean, you know, their wings are nicely formed and very easy to tell it's a white fly. On the sticky card, it helps to have some magnification because those wings are usually mangled up a little bit a little bit more difficult to tell uh, apart from other things. So it really does help, again, to uh, have some magnification there. Which brings me to headband magnifiers or a jeweler's lens, okay? So these are, you know, the clip on or by a strap go around the head. Highly recommend having one of these for uh, monitoring uh, because they, they really help you get closer and keep your, you know, your hands free um, for flipping over leaves and things. And they're not a heavy investment, you know, just. Google search headband magnifier, uh, and you'll find some examples. And again, that headband magnifier can be very important because on the undersides of leaves, it can be very hard to see some of these life stages. These little orange things, and I, get, I don't think y'all can see my mouse. I don't know if there's a way to annotate. Mm, here we go, what's this button do? Pointer, pen, ooh, spotlight. Can you guys see oh. my map? Yeah, you got it. You see a red dot? All right, perfect. Yeah, so these these little things right here, these are eggs. And sometimes, um, let's see if I can find it here. It's like kind of in a semicircle right here. It's like in a full out circle. That's because those females like to kind of feed as they're laying eggs. Uh, and so imagine putting like a needle in the ground and she's like laying an egg and turning around that needle because she's you know, using that to basically feed. Uh, so oftentimes these eggs will be in full circles. And if they're kind of darker, that's usually because the nymph has already left. So these are now the younger instars, like right here, the, some young instars right here as well and here. They can be very difficult to see on the naked eye, especially if you don't have all these other life stages on here. Uh, and so it helps a lot to look on the undersides of leaves. We can see this honeydew uh, starting to form here that they're uh, excreting. And we can see some of these pupa. So as soon as they're quite inflated with the red eyes, uh, these are going to be new adults coming out. They are no longer actively feeding in this stage and are ready to come out. And these are their exuvia. So after they come out of the pupa, it's just an empty case, right? Uh, so if you spray insecticides and you still see these, um, that's because, you know, your insecticide won't do anything against an exuvia, right? So that's going to stay on there. Um, you know, sometimes over time they will fall off, but, um, you know, there's no point in trying to manage the exuvia. Oh, interesting. When I have the laser pointer, I can't advance the slide. All right, here we go. And in terms of the distribution, right? So we've done quite a bit of monitoring of white flies, and this is uh, the number of white flies on an individual plant on the bottom, and this is the number of times uh, we, we saw a particular instance. So most of the times when we looked at poinsettias, there were zero white flies on there. And then there are some instances where we find one or two or 
you know, up to 10, maybe very few. There's very few instances that we find a lot. And this is at the end of a crop cycle, right? So this is after the population has built. So it's very important to inspect a whole lot of poinsettias or a whole lot of plants for your white flies and over a wide distribution, right? So over a large area, don't just look at them at the edge, uh, kind of look at them all over because this plant right here is going to act as a source population for the rest that's going to build up over time. There's now for uh, management, right? You can do insect screening. We spoke about this with thrips as well. You can see here that they've built out a frame over the ventilation to help increase the surface area. Uh, so you're not straining your vents too much. You can see here now the screen over it, uh, which again, you know, uh, especially if you're anywhere close to like cotton fields or any other source populations outside, you, you can get a lot of white flies coming in that way. So you can eliminate a lot uh, of cost of insecticides or cult crop by uh, setting up these nets where practical. There are a few biological control options. So here's an example of a predatory mite known as Amblesius swirskii and a parasitic wasp known as Eremosphorus aremicus. So these predatory mites, you can see right here, they'll feed on eggs and younger nymphs of the white flies and they'll kind of crawl around. They are invisible to the naked eye. So or I should say practically invisible to the naked eye. So, uh, you know, it, it's not a concern, uh, you know, if they are going to market, let's say, with some of these predatory mites on there. And these uh, parasitic wasps, also very tiny, and they're laying eggs uh, under second and third instar nymphs, and their larvae basically eat the insides of that nymph until nothing's left, and then a new uh, wasp comes out. So they have good dispersal ability, and these ones are good, the, the mites on the left are good at kind of hanging out and waiting um, for, for white fly eggs to be produced. And they're both pretty high temperature tolerance. So we've worked with these two, this is what I'm currently researching, uh, if we can use them to manage white flies, specifically on poinsettias. So when we're talking biological control, uh, you, you have to make sure you have things that are going to, you know, manage all the pests you might get on your crop. So the nice thing about poinsettias is that, you know, white flies are the main pest. Uh, so if you can manage them, you're in good shape. And, you know, whereas if we had also like an abundance of mealybugs or thrips and things like that, it can make things a bit more complicated. You need to either add more predators or if they don't exist, you have to use pesticides that would kill those other uh, pests without hurting your beneficials. And so this is not a specific endorsement of copper, but this is just an example of how the wasps are released. Uh, the, you know, lack of PPE requirements when releasing these is, is quite nice in the hot summers. You just go around and hang these. And a close look here, you can see these are uh, full of these little pupa, about 90 um, parasitic wasp pupa. They slowly come out over, over time and they'll fly out and look for those white flies. And when it comes to the predatory mites, you actually, they come in this carrier material. So they're kind of mixed in with like little wood chips and things like that. And you actually blow them um, across the, the crop here. So you can see this is like a little uh, blower uh, device that came from one of these companies as well. And they are dispersed uh, this way across the crop. Nope, oh, let's watch that again. No, thanks. All right. And this is kind of what it can look like, right? So this material uh, can be blown right off before uh, shipping out. Uh, this is a, actually a pretty high density. You typically wouldn't have this much of the carrier material on there. Um, and it's actually kind of funny. You know, my brother had messaged me recently. He had gotten a plant. And uh, sometimes these things come in little bags and little sachets, they call them, that uh, stick inside the pot and the mites slowly come out of them over time. My brother was, you know, he saw this bag on his plant and he thought it was something he had to put on the plant. So he like ripped it open and just poured it on the plant and then saw what it said on there afterwards and asked me if I knew what it was. And I was like, yeah, it's all your, you know, predatory mites. So there's probably nothing left in there, but uh, if there was, you just, you know, threw all your extra predatory mites on there. So I think, you know, on a, on a consumer side, um, they don't really uh, seem to care or mind if there are some uh, predators on there. And we've just started doing some, uh, you know, actual commercial trials. So this is on poinsettias. This is a proportion of plants infested with, you know, at least one, fly, one white fly or more. You can see our insecticide house here over the 18 weeks of the trial versus a biological control house. You can see at a certain point, it gets to almost about 50% of the plant have something on them. Uh, we can come in with some remedial applications and it went down to a point where it was still considered quite acceptable when it went out to the retailer. It should be noted 
However, so that's actually very interesting. So this house actually just had much lower pressure, uh, Wi-Fi pressure, because we're monitoring on a regular basis. And our grower, due to the fact that we were monitoring, was not spraying and we didn't see anything. Um, and so they actually saved a lot of money just from monitoring. And so again, that's, you know, I, I, I highly recommend just spend some time monitoring because uh, you can save yourself a lot of money in insecticidal dollars by only spraying when you need to. So I think they only did two or three insecticide applications here, whereas normally they'd be spraying uh, every week or every two weeks. And this is a different grower, location B. And you can see uh, the biological control house and the chemical house actually track each other much more similarly. So these two greenhouses are actually right next to each other. So you have similar white fly pressure. So I think this is a little bit more of a fair comparison, let's say. But again, we're doing quite a bit of trials to just see um, how feasible this really is in Texas. And just to wrap up, talking about insecticidal control, right? It's always vital to have good coverage. You want to rotate your modes of action so you do not get uh, insecticide resistance. You want to break the life cycle, which we already spoke about when it comes to the eggs, you know, spray again on a one or a two week interval to get the new nymphs that have emerged. And beware of the meme one versus uh, the med biotypes, right? That they have uh, different resistances. So what I've done is uh, in the handouts, you shall see an, um, an Excel spreadsheet that contains both um, the research I did on thrips insecticides from a couple sessions ago, and more recently, uh, the whitefly insecticides. So I've kind of broken it down by you know, trade name. Again, this is not, uh, I'm not trying to endorse a specific um, company with these trade names. It's just to give you a familiar name. Some of these are gonna be off uh, patent. So there might be some generics uh, that might be less expensive or worth looking at. Uh, but I have the active ingredient, right? The re-entry interval, uh, mode of action number. So this is what you want to rotate. And the efficacy uh, reported either on meme one, so the B biotype and or the med biotype. And this is the number of studies. So, you know, in this case, it was one IR4 study. So that's, I don't know how reliable that information is because it's just a single study. Whereas this information here on the right side, in this case is four IR4 studies. Uh, and so that's you know going to be a lot more reliable if you have four studies that have showed good to excellent control of the med biotype. So again, you're going to have this Excel spreadsheet. If you are not here in live human person form right now and you're watching the recording, um, I'm going to just kind of go through these next few slides in a way that you can pause and or collect the data. So this one is all um, insecticides that work excellent to good to excellent for both biotypes. In this one here, we have uh, insecticides that either work good to excellent for the meme one or good to excellent for um, the med biotype. Somewhat exclusively, so there are some cases where there's a lack of information, so it's but not available. So if you just assume poor at the least, it is at least still really good to excellent for the other biotype. And this last and, and from, slide here. Can we go back? Yes. Can we go back? Yeah, I'm going back. The first mm -hmm. one, the first chemical uh, flagship, should there be a H between T and O? Yes, there should. Thank you. That's okay. thymethoxam. Yes. Thank you so much for catching that. Yeah, so that's thymethoxam. And, you know, for any of you that are selling to the big box stores, right, any of these four A's you probably can't use anyway. So these are all the neonicotinoids. Um, or, or you're gonna have to add an extra label in your pot depending on um, kind of the retailer you're working with. But yeah, thank you for that correction there. And this last one here is kind of a little bit less reliable or not as good efficacy. But again, please pay attention to the number of studies, right? So this one might say poor, but there was just one uh, IR4 study. So, you know, maybe, maybe as more uh, data comes out, um, it'll be uh, good to go. Uh, and so the very last thing was I want to pitch, um, Meng Meng invited me to pitch a couple podcasts that we've started up. Uh, one is with a friend, Dr. Well, almost Dr. Vikram Baliga. And this one's actually a podcast where we're going to discuss uh, research papers uh, relevant to the green industry. So trees and ornamentals um, and kind of digest them. So uh, we're going to kind of break it down. One of the first ones, the first episode is actually going to come out next week. So we have just a trailer up and you can find this it's called Jolly Green Scientists on the iTunes podcast or Google podcast or any of those. And um, the next, the, the very first episode is talking about 
um, this, this very interesting study about a certain class of insecticides that actually reduces uh, plant defenses and makes us susceptible to other insects. Uh, and in this one on the right, the first one will be airing in three weeks. And again, I have a trailer uh, at the moment, which is called Talking Bugs. If you're just interested in learning more about insects and entomologists, every single time I interview a new entomologist and talk about some of their most recent research, um, so that's kind of a, I'm pretty excited about this because I get to just talk to a lot of cool entomologists about uh, the research. So that's all I got for you all today. Well, thank you, Erhong. Uh, you, yeah. you went way over time. And, uh, Wait, did I go way over? <laughs> you went. No, no, 25 minutes. I went five minutes over. <laughs> but, uh, but Dr. Becky Grubbs is totally fine with that. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I can see you actually saying, keep going, Erhong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why didn't you guys call the podcast two guys that are almost PhDs? Two almost PhDs. <laughs> two, two almost docs. Oh, yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because there's just too many of those people that it would just be too nondescriptive. <laughs> oh, so you guys are TBDs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got TBDs. Two B TBDs. You guys are also ABDs. <laughs> <laughs> so to be Thank doctors, Becky for uh, going over there. All, uh, I apologize all, all the dissertation. Oh, no, I don't. It's fine. Everybody's sick of hearing me anyway, so that's whatever. Oh, hey. don't worry. Same, same as me. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to talk about probably for the last time today, um, a little bit about different turf varieties, and I'm going to do it within the context of another SCRI project. And so we've talked about so how SCRI. many SCRI projects are you on, Becky? Oh my <laughs> goodness. No, this is great that you keep well, you keep have different things, you know, and the only thing that I can talk about is cray myrtle bark scale. Cray myrtle bark scale. I two of them are related. So really there's only like two that are, are like kind of separate unique areas. Um and so but I am gonna start off talking a little bit about what SBRI is because um, you know, I feel like we mention or allude to a variety of different SCRI projects on here, and, and I don't know, you know, depending on our audience, uh, when we say that, that may mean absolutely nothing to some people. And so I wanted to kind of briefly introduce um, what SCRI is, and, and um, so you can, and you can find more information about it. I've got the link here, but I'll also share it in the chat, and Mung Mung can share it with you guys if you want to read more about it, or you can just Google. Um, but SCRI stands for Specialty Crops Research Initiative. Um, and this is a program uh, that's funded by the U United States Department of Agriculture, so the USDA, um, as part of their uh, NEPA program, so their National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Um, and the objective of SCRI, I just pulled this directly from their website, is uh, to support research and extension that addresses key challenges of national, regional, and multi-state importance in sustaining all components of food and agriculture, including conventional and organic food production systems. Um, and one of the things that I, I guess I wanted to point out about SCRI that kind of makes it special and why you will hear about these types of projects more um, when you interface with people in the turf and, and ornamental industry is that we don't have a lot of federal grants available to those of us that work in turf and ornamentals. So There's just um, fewer federal grant opportunities um, compared to more traditional uh, agronomic crops that are food and fiber crops. And SCRI is one opportunity where we get to do um, really, where we get to apply for a very large um, uh, Inter, cross, you know, cross institutional grant where we work with multiple universities and they can get some some good federal funding to solve problems in our industry. And so, um, Becky, there, Becky, uh, let me put this yeah. in the Chinese for the audience. Uh, that for the, the uh, so what uh, Becky said, even with all those things, you know, still the vegetable and fruits get like 99% of the uh, funding. So ornamentals like the cream myrtle bark seal that, uh, that we're doing and then the turf that Becky and her group is doing is like we're literally I mean it's the uh, chance like a um, like a hit in the jackpot literally yeah. it's like having it hit in a jackpot so I hope that you all understand the Chinese I was talking about <laughs> yeah so um, and they typically address like one of five, these projects typically address one of five key areas. And so um, they'll have research and plant breeding genetics, genomics, and other methods to improve crop characteristics. 
um, efforts to identify and address threats from pests and disease, including threats to specialty crop pollinators, uh, efforts to improve production efficiency, handling, processing, productivity, and profitability over the long term, uh, new innovations and in technology, including improved mechanization and technologies that delay or inhibit ripening, uh, and methods to prevent, detect, monitor, control, and respond to potential food safety hazards in the production efficiency, handling, and processing of specialty crops. And so I did pull like a few that um, Texas A&M has been funded for, just to kind of give you a sense of some of the topic areas that are being explored by Texas A&M researchers right now. Um, so this is one being studied, uh, table to farm a sustainable systems-based approach for safer and healthier melon supply chains. So like Meng Meng was saying, a lot of the grants that get funded or proposals that get funded tend to be fruit and vegetable related because a lot of times the priority for NEPA is to concentrate their effort on food production crops. Um, oh, look, hey, look at that. Look at that. Systematic st strategies to manage crepe myrtle bark scale and emerging exotic pests. You make it sound really ex exotic. I like that term, Meng Meng. It's really cool. Um, it is, and then you've got. Exotic. It is exotic. I know, but it just makes it sound like all the more like mysterious and exciting. So It, it is mysterious and exciting. <laughs> what are you trying to say? It sounds like. Well, I'm just trying to say, what I'm trying to say is it sounds really sexy, okay? It sounds like some really sexy research when you call it exotic. We so. literally <laughs> had to do a DNA test to uh, make sure that was not the native azalea bark scale. It was, you know, genetically different, the exotic uh, crape myrtle bark scale. And yeah. we all know genetics is sexy, so sorry, yeah, it is. we'll stop interrupting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and then this is another one that I've talked about briefly on here, another one that I'm a part of um, that was written by Mookie by Bakke and I, um, Research and Extension to Address Herbicide Resistance in uh, Annual Bluegrass and Managed Turf Systems. So that's um, some work that's ongoing. Um, but the project that I wanted to talk about today is one that I don't think I've mentioned on here before. Um, and we are in kind of the third round of funding. Um, for this work that involves a lot of the same collaborators and has since 2010. So we've done about 10 years of work um, for this objective already, and we've just started a new round. And so um, these are the different titles for the different uh, grants that have been uh, submitted over the years. So the initial uh, proposal in 2010, plant genetics and genomics to improve drought and salinity tolerance for sustainable turf production in the Southern United States. And that was actually written by Dr. Ndika Chandra. And for those of you that are not familiar, Dr. Chandra is our turf grass breeder for Texas A&M. Uh, and then 2015, persistent survival and recovery of warm season turf grasses um, for sustainable urban landscapes. That's one that I got to kind of join on the tail end of. Uh, that grant was uh, submitted by Dr. Kevin Kenworthy at the University of Florida. Uh, and then most recently, we've been approved for another round of this that was submitted by uh, Dr. Susanna Miller Lewis um, at North Carolina State. And so the objective of all of these, though, um, has been the very integrated project designed to breed and evaluate turf grasses uh, for parts of the southern United States where water is becoming increasingly limited. So there's a lot of emphasis put on breeding new grasses that exhibit superior drought tolerance, uh, evaluating those grasses uh, in a number of different ways. And so we subject them to different irrigation regimes to evaluate their performance. Um, you know, they're evaluated in multiple states States, which I'll, I'll share those states here in a minute um, to expose them to different environmental conditions. Um, and we also evaluate salinity tolerance. And the thinking behind that, um, which we kind of talked about last week, is that, um, you know, with uh, more limited irrigation water supplies, um, a lot more facilities are relying more and more on reclaimed water um, to sustain their turf grass areas. And with that comes some water quality concerns. And so um, considering salinity tolerance with these species is important. And so a um, lot of big players involved in this, you know, at Texas A&M, we have five faculty, I believe, involved in this uh, project right now. And that's just for our, our university. And that doesn't even include all of our staff. And so right now, the collaborators for this work uh, include Texas A&M, of course, uh, North Carolina State University, the University of Florida, the University of Georgia, Oklahoma State University, and for this newest round, we also uh, now have University of California Riverside, um, which are fairly new to our group, but they've already been really instrumental 
um, and kind of helping us with a lot of work. So um, project objectives, as kind of outlined by the grant proposal, include um, that we wanted to improve our understanding of turf grass performance under drought. We want to continue a pipeline of germplasm development and evaluation of advanced lines. So that's you know to have successful breeding projects uh, related to producing these warm season turf cultivars. Uh, develop marker assisted breeding systems. Um, and uh, there has always been an extension and outreach component to these grants, uh, but it's kind of been expanded on for this new round because um, you know increasingly I think what we are seeing as an industry is a lot more emphasis put on on the social science aspect of the work that we do, um, how do we better understand what motivates uh, the behavioral or management decisions people make uh, in their landscapes or in their businesses, um, and how do we design outreach that is going to effectively encourage uh, behavioral change? And so, you know, certainly I think that there's a lot of things that um, extension, and I don't just mean agri-life extension, I mean extension, um, as, as a as something that we see at multiple universities and in multiple states across the country, there are things that we have done really well historically, um, but we're also uh, an ever-changing world, and Texas in particular is increasingly more urban. We have a lot more uh, homeowners that manage uh, landscape areas and contribute to the environment and to the depletion of our resources, and it's becoming really important for us to think of new ways to communicate with those people. And so that's a really big part of this grant is we actually have um, some social scientists involved uh, to conduct surveys and, and to do other things to kind of look at how do we get the most out of our outreach materials? Because, you know, ultimately um, we can produce the greatest graphs in the world that are extremely drought tolerant. But if we cannot effectively convey to people how to manage those grasses differently or water them less, um, then, you know, we're not getting the most out of that work. And so there's, there's definitely a lot of different um, elements of this, uh, to this, and that's one of them. So um, I also really liked, this was pulled, this is language from the most recent grant submittal, um, and I really liked this because I feel like it really um, showcases the importance of these types of grants. Um, so it says, we avoid duplication of efforts and increase efficiency by sharing methodologies and knowledge. Discoveries in one program can be applied to another without the lag of publication. So if we think about the way a lot of research is performed traditionally at research institutions, um, we use published research from other programs to inform the work that we do. Um, but if you have people that are actively working together toward a common goal and can share that, that data and can share findings before it goes through the formal publication, uh, publication process, it really expedites. Um, how quickly uh, things can move forward. Um, our synergistic approach to breeding efforts has the added benefit of devoting more resources to a common problem. Uh, duplication will not occur because each location has its own unique set of environmental pressure that will impart different selection pressures on exchanges uh, germplasm. So um, this is another aspect is, you know, part of this research project. Um, we have all of these really um, successful warm season turf grass breed programs that exchange each other's material for evaluation in multiple geographic locations, multiple soil types. And so it allows us to co uh, collect really comprehensive data on how these grasses perform in a wide range of environments and soil types and to kind of share that with one another. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, so this, these grants have focused primarily on four warm season turf grass species that we've talked about quite a bit um, at various points here on Chat with Green Aggies, um, including Bermuda grass, Zoysia grass, St. Augustine grass, and seashore half palm, which I kind of introduced uh, last week to those of you that weren't super familiar yet. Uh, and so far to date, um, they have screened more than 2,500 experimental breeding lines from these grasses. Uh, to try to identify uh, some, some cultivars that really stand out in terms of their performance uh, and advance those um, for further analysis and then commercial distribution. Um, so for those of you that are familiar, I always think this is kind of interesting to know uh, where different grass species breeding efforts are in the United States. 
Um, so uh, for the, the universities that are involved in this grant, this kind of breaks down uh, which ones work on which grasses. And so you'll see Bermuda grass uh, primarily concentrated at the University of Georgia, North Carolina State, uh, and Oklahoma State, which we've talked a little bit about, particularly some of OSU, uh, OSU's grasses before. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, and University of Florida Gainesville is also on there as well. Uh, St. Augustine Graph is going to be a University of Florida, NC State, and Texas A&M um, kind of focal point. Seashore Pass Palum is primarily evaluated at the University of Georgia now, uh, but we do have some private researchers, including here in the state of Texas, that also do some work on this. They're just not involved in this uh, particular grant. Uh, and then Zoysia Graph, we see evaluated at, at almost every institution involved, uh, with the exception of Oklahoma State. So to date, we've had a few releases, and some of these I've already talked about in previous programs, but now you kind of know that they come from this, um, you know, 10 years of research by multiple institutions and collaborators. And so um, we've got at least uh, six releases from this work so far, including Tip Tough and Tahoma 31 Bermuda grasses, uh, Tamstar and Citra Blue St. Augustine grasses, uh, and two other Zoysia grasses um, that come from, uh, I believe those are Florida, Florida lines. So I wanted to talk about a little, uh, some of these in a little bit more detail um, today um, than I have previously. So uh, one of the first of these is uh, the Tip Tough. And I mentioned in the previous presentation that Tip Tough, um, you know, this is a very uh, solid performer here in the state of Texas. Um, it was evaluated as part of the National Turfgrass Evaluation Program, which is its own evaluation process. But a lot of the people involved in this work are also involved in that program. Um, and, you know, it tip tough in the state of Texas between 2013 and 2017 was the top performer with respect to turf quality or the visual appearance uh, and quality of the turf. Uh oh. I don't know what just happened. There we go. Okay. Um, and then, um, you know, this has also been evaluated in additional research trials, particularly, I mean, we've got it at every location involved in this study for evaluation in, in irrigation components. Um, and then University of Georgia has also evaluated it, uh, you know, with respect to traffic tolerance and has collected data on other properties. So the first picture here is uh, under drought stress. You can see how tip tough performs compared to celebration for mutograph. Um, TikTok was something that originally was kind of uh, developed initially by uh, Dr. Wayne Hanna at the University of Georgia in 1992, and it's only been recently released. So it gives you a kind of a sense of how long sometimes it takes for these grasses to go through this process and then finally be released for uh, commercial use. Um, this is uh, significantly more drought tolerant than a lot of the other Bermuda grasses that we have on the market. Uh, tolerates considerable wear, uh, better than both TIF weight and celebration, which are both kind of uh, uh, commercial standards that we that we use a lot um, to compare these new hybrids to. Uh, in one study, they found that TIF Tough uses 38% less water than TIF Way. Uh, and TIF Tough is readily available here in the state of Texas. So you might have heard me mention before um, the breeder for this at the University of Georgia is actually from Texas originally. He's got some strong ties to the state and a good relationship with a lot of our growers here. Um, and then here you can see that he's got some data on how uh, TIF Tough uh, traffic tolerance compared to celebration and TIF Way. So this is a, gr a good performer. You know, last week I had some questions about, you know, can these grasses be used in home lots? TIF Tough, absolutely. TIF Tough is one that we may see incorporated onto golf courses, professional sports, uh, sports fields, or easily uh, higher end uh, residential and commercial landscapes. You know, it is going to be a little bit more costly than a common Bermuda grass, for example, or even some of our older hybrids because it's newer cultivar uh, and it's still certified and regulated. So there's a little more cost associated, but certainly it would be a really attractive and nice performer in a, land, a residential landscape. All right, then another one to discuss is this one, Tahoma 31. So this is another one that's been released as a function of the SCRI efforts. And uh, this is Dr. Dennis Mark Martin and Dr. Yang Chi Wu at uh, Oklahoma State. And so uh, Dr. Wu is the breeder there. Dr. Martin is one of their turf extension specialists there. They're both really, really nice people. Um, and <clears throat> uh, with a lot of the graphics from Oklahoma State's program, we typically see 
um, significantly improved cold tolerance. Um, Oklahoma State is in the transition zone. It's a cooler environment um, that really allows them to do a lot of food research in developing uh, grasses with improved cold tolerance. Uh, Tahoma 31 has a really attractive, dense uh, growth habit with a fine bladed texture. It's really pleasant to kind of stand on with your bare feet. It's also a low water user with some drought resistance. Um, very cold hardy, good early spring green up. And this is becoming increasingly important uh, as we have like, for example, sports fields um, that have longer playing seasons than they used to have historically. And there's an interest in having grasses that green up earlier and stay green longer without having to overseed. Um, so here you'll see uh, that this is kind of some numbers to demonstrate uh, cold tolerance. So these are winter kill rates uh, for Bermuda grasses tested as part of the INTEP trial. Uh, they saw with celebration 98% winter kill as a function of multiple frosts. Uh, tiff tough 97.3% winter kill. Tiff way 98%. And then Tahoma 31 only 4% winter kill. So uh, that's a pretty uh, stark difference there with respect to cold tolerance. All right, this is another one, um, Citra Blue. So Citra Blue has been in development at the University of Florida since 2006. Um, it's, you know, named is a really rich, dark blue color that's very attractive. It really stands out when you put it side by side with some of the other St. Augustine grasses. Uh, it also has a little bit more horizontal growth as opposed to some of the more upright growth that we may see with other cultivars like Floratium. Uh, this lends itself to a reduced mowing requirement. It also can help improve the density of this turf, which can help uh, pre prevent weed encroachment. Uh, and it also, they found, has, seems to have a reduced fertilizer requirement and, in general, is a very consistent performer from year to year. Now, to, uh, as of now, we do not have any growers here in the state of Texas that are uh, producing citra blue. So um, it's, it's a really interesting grass, very attractive, but it would be hard to maybe get your hands on here uh, in Texas. And then I am going to talk about Tamstar. Um, so Tamstar is one that we developed here at Texas a um, through our breeding efforts here at the, at the Dallas Center. Dr. Chandra's program helped to uh, develop this grass. And um, it had some really promising, really excellent attributes, including that it had superior drought tolerance compared to uh, any of the other uh, commercially available St. Augustine grasses on the market. So you can see this is actually a photo on the bottom here that I took. Um, from our research plot in College Station a couple of years ago. And you can see the toll that prolonged drought uh, took on some of these other St. Augustine lines compared to the TM star. So really significant difference there in performance. Um, it also has um, some improved shade tolerance. It has some uh, chinch bug resistance, some uh, improved disease resistance, particularly to gray leaf spot. Uh, and some decent cold tolerance because it was developed at the Dallas Center. Now, unfortunately, one of the issues that we ran into is despite the fact that this was really promising and had some really strong um, characteristics, uh, once we actually got it out to our growers for commercial production, um, we had a really hard time uh, getting it off the ground from a commercial standpoint. So um, it sometimes had issues with establishment. And then um, from the growers perspective, it was difficult for them to harvest and block this turf, meaning that when they would go in and try to harvest it, um, it would kind of just fall apart. And so, um, you know, and that was really disappointing because those are, those are things that we try to evaluate for on the research side. But, you know, there's a big difference between how you, you know, analyze things in a research setting and, and what happens when you get them out in the field. And so you can still um, find TAMSTAR, uh, I know you can find it at, at some of the Carolina farms out on the East Coast. There may still be one or two here that have it, but it's not, uh, unfortunately, not really available here in Texas. Um, and as a function of that, we have really uh, stepped up our, our game for evaluating some of these new St. Augustine lines. And so um, this is actually a piece of equipment that's designed to evaluate tensile strength. And so it evaluates how much pressure is required to tear this piece of sod in half, um, kind of how well the sod holds together. Uh, and then over here, these are pictures from some applied research that was uh, funded by the turf grass producers of Texas. We have it at the College Station location as well as uh, here in Dallas, um, where we have 
five additional new lines from the Texas A&M program that are really promising contenders. Um, they seem to exhibit superior drought tolerance. They have some different um, aesthetic characteristics that are pretty desirable. And so we have five of those in a study kind of evaluating their performance in the field in response to some of the herbicides that are commonly used by our side growers. Um, and we've got Raleigh and Floritam in there as a comparison. So we're trying to really put a lot of energy into doing our due diligence as to how do these grasses perform in a production setting um, and making sure that only the grasses that we feel are commercially sustainable as well as excellent performers in the landscape um, are advanced for release. So I have talked about these resources before, but for those of you that have not tuned in before, I wanted to make sure that I shared them. So um, texasgrass.com is our turfgrass producers of Texas website, and they actually have been updating it recently. And so there's some different ways to search for growers within the state that um, you can search as a homeowner or you can search as a wholesaler. Um, and so we're a professional, so um, you can kind of get a feel for what varieties or cultivars do we have here, who's growing them, and where are they. And then um, also there is the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, um, which is a you know, nationwide initiative to evaluate experimental turf grass lines, both warm and cool season grasses all over the country. And that data is accessible to the public as well. Um, so you can visit their website and uh, it's quite um, a lot to go through, um, but if you are a professional and this is something that's interesting to you, it, it may be worth it just to kind of see how some of these grasses perform in different locations. Well, thank you, Becky. Uh, do you want to show? Uh, do you want to show the uh, you know the the top of some of the the plant arts that you have at the back? So, oh yeah, my plant art. <laughs> yeah, your plant art. <laughs> Yeah, I've got some new new guys that I hung yesterday. <laughs> okay, I think I'm the uh, presenter. Uh, so, uh, Paul, Paul, you're going to talk about Plan of the Week, one of the Texas superstars. Yes, I will. Thank you, Meng Meng. Uh, so for your Texas superstar commercial today, um, we will be talking about the flare. Hibiscus. So flare hibiscus is a um, mosquito species, um, very low maintenance, perennial, uh, that performs extremely well, especially here in the Houston area. Um, Nonstop blooms throughout the summer. Uh, so there, this breeding was from Dr. Moy, who was out at the uh, San Antonio Botanical Garden. Um, loves the full sun. Uh, so the first one uh, that came on uh, into the market was, uh, this is flare. So it's sort of that red fuchsia color. Again, uh, flower size on all three of these are nine inches, 10 inches plus. Um, then from flare, uh, pink flare was, was um, introduced and you can see the size of the plant. So again, with all these mosquitoes, um, the flowers last for one day, um, but they are just nonstop throughout the, uh, the heat of the summer. And then the third one that was added was uh, uh, peppermint flare, which is really unique uh, in that it's got these fuchsia pink striations. It's got the dark fuchsia eye, and so it gives it a you know a different look, um, definitely in the landscape. Uh, all three of these would work extremely well. Again, if you're if you're a landscaper, you're going to want these further back in the bed, um, and have other uh, plants come up in front of them. Um, if you're a grower, propagation-wise, um, nothing really um, out of the ordinary. Very easy to uh, to propagate, um, quick to finish in a container. So probably a two-gallon, maybe three-gallon um, would work best. Um, but these are three really good, strong plants that will perform well throughout the state of Texas. Mung Mung, you're on mute right now. Thank you. Thank you, Airfong. Uh, I want to get our panel's uh, um, input on this plant. Uh, and as you can see that uh, uh, it says, you know, the, the question is from a suburban, uh, an audience from suburban New Orleans, you know, uh, as our opinion about this culprit, a possible uh, fix to this azalea issues. Leaves are stunted uh, since bloom. 
and she thinks she or he thinks it's uh, nematodes. It's doomed. Age twenty years. What do you all think? This uh, this azalea, um, currently looking like this. Does this remind you uh, the crape myrtle uh, picture that I showed during our uh, first episode? I think April the ninth. Remember that one? What do you all think? No, one at a time. No. What? Uh, question I have is uh, no herbicides were applied in the area? That's actually uh, quite the opposite. Uh, that was not mentioned, but I think that may be the, I would think that may be the case. Uh, Erfron and Becky and Laura, you guys remember the, the cray myrtle uh, plant, you know, that I showed and also in the same uh, location, you know, uh, Pear, uh, the pear tree, they, the leaves were showing this kind of stonic growth. Remember oh, that? darn. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a Bradford pear fan of fans. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I think your point being that you're seeing different plant species with the same symptoms, it's usually some kind of chemical non pathogenic yeah. cause. Yeah. Right. Non-biotic. It's well. Non-biotic. Yeah. yeah. This way is, is anyway. this way is probably. I mean, you know, uh, Paul. I I did not get a chance to ask a question about herbicide, but this looks pretty. Uh, if I have to bet my money on it, I would say pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, you know, with uh, some something like you know, like 2,4-D or that kind of thing. That would be my best guess. What do you all think? Erfan, do you think there's any mites or uh, or something that may cause like, uh, you know, this kind of stunted uh, leaf growth? Yeah, that's what I was trying to see if there's any, you know, photographed evidence of say like aerified mites type of thing on Azalea. I think that's what I'd be looking into as a potential culprit in terms of arthropods. Um, but I, I, I'm not familiar with any cases um, where, where that type of symptom has been caused by mites. Maybe Irfan, this is what about, Azalea uh, bark scale. No. Yeah. <laughs> er, Irfan, you know, broad mite damage wouldn't be over the entire plant either like that, would it? Or isn't broad All mite right. damage usually more localized or to a certain section? Uh, where this is, it looks like the entire plant is, is showing these uh, symptoms. Yeah, well, I mean, there's only a section of the plant that's in focus, but yeah, I mean, yes, I would agree that usually insect damage in general is is usually um, not perfectly uniform. Yeah, I think I would, you know, ask some questions about what's been treated in that landscape recently. And even if it's not something that they themselves treated, I mean, you could have some drift injury from a neighboring lawn that could have some significant implications for broadleaf plants, depending on what somebody was trying to do. So. Uh, one of the audience input is that this could be nutritional deficiency, the azaleas or heavy feeders. Do you guys think this could be nutrient deficiency? Uh, but, would, but would you see the same Sensitivity in Bradford pear. No, 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 no. This is not with the Bradford pear. This is this is this is the this is actually a picture from New Orleans. I uh, I I wouldn't think this is a nutritional deficiency uh, because you know nutritional deficiency you may see uh, very rarely that you see this kind of stunted uh, new leaf growth. You know you see the leaf color either the new leaf color. Uh, turning yellowish uh, green or the the bottom leaf, um, it I I think you rarely see stunted leaf growth, new growth, when it comes to nutritional deficiency. What do you think, Paul and Laura? And well, Becky? I think like it looks like um, zinc deficiency in pecan or little leaf in in uh, uh, birch. You know, the, those are like micronutrient deficiencies that cause. That, that kind one, of symptom. That I've that, never seen that on Azalea. Yeah, that one is uh is nick is nickel called a, a mouse ear nickel, disease. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah. it's called mouse ear disease. It's really not a disease. Oh. That's uh you know, and and that one has a very uh 
you know, it's called a mouse ear. It has a very distinctive uh, uh, leaf shape that, that shows that. And, and normally it only happens on the two plants that you mentioned. One is birch, uh, often river birch in this area, and then on pecans. But it, I never seen it on azaleas. And again, the leaf shape on this one doesn't really look like. Pecans is zinc. Pecans is zinc. Yeah, it's like the line of the tail, yeah. kind of, yeah. yeah. And you get plenty of the new growth. But mm -hmm. I think that's a question the soil test could shed a lot of light on, too. And, you know, I, I guess another question would be has anybody seen nematode, nematode damage? On an azalea before. I mean, I mean, I, I, I have. Uh, so I, I have it in Florida. Nematodes were like the state, not insect, but you know, soil <laughs> problem. Big roundworm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so they were everywhere, and I didn't see azaleas look like this. State culprit. State culprit. There you go. Yeah. 